There's a man who bought a brand new hunting dog. And he was eager to get this dog into the woods so he could see how he would perform. So he took the dog to track a bear one day. And no sooner had he gotten in the woods that this dog got the scent of a bear. And he started after this bear chasing him, but all of a sudden, this dog halted. And he smelled a rabbit that had crossed the bear's path. So he started chasing the rabbit. And this went on all afternoon. Animal after animal, this, this dog just started tracking other animals other than the bear, but each one crossed the bear's path. All of a sudden, this man found this dog, caught up to him. He was breathless. And wouldn't you know it, he had a squirrel up a tree. You know, we spend a lot of time chasing rabbit trails, don't we? We can go off chasing in so many different directions that sometimes we miss the important things in life. Don't let this happen to you. Because it happens to me all the time. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to be looking at Nehemiah chapter 6 this morning where we're going to see the rabbit trails that Nehemiah could have followed. But he chose not to. Nehemiah chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, says this. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Grisham the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Grisham sent, sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together in Hakafrim, in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. Now the plain of Ono is about 37 miles <coughs> northwest of Jerusalem. It was kind of halfway between the two cities. So it, was, it made sense that he would ask them to meet there. It was kind of a, a compromise when he said, well, let's kind of meet halfway. To me, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? Why not try to work out an agreement that's suitable to both parties? But there was only one problem, folks. Nehemiah smells a rabbit. I mean, I mean, he smells a rat. He smells a rat because they intended to do him harm. After all, why would they ask him to come 37 miles, a whole day's journey, leave the wall just to meet with them? Nehemiah decided he wasn't going to stop work on that wall, especially at the risk of, of getting killed. So Nehemiah says in verses 3 and 4, I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. Nehemiah stayed at the task that God had called him to. He refused to get sidetracked. He refused to make concessions that took him away from the ministry, from the job that God had called him to do. You see, Nehemiah refused to compromise, folks, especially with the enemy. And you know what? That's what we need to do. We need to refuse to compromise with Satan. Amen. But so often we do. We go ahead and do what he wants us to do, following sin because it looks so good. 
So when the enemy comes calling, don't be sidetracked by compromise. Don't get off on a rabbit trail making concessions with the enemy. Don't be diverted from the primary task that God has given you by conceding to those who don't have the same core values that you have. Back in 2015, the Harvard Review published a very interesting article about the game of Monopoly. Now, I know I, I mentioned Monopoly last week as well. But did you know the original version that came out in 1900 was called the Landlord's Game? And the lady that created it, Elizabeth Maggie, developed it with caution in mind. It wasn't how many monopolies you could make, but the caution was the monopolies themselves, that they would do harm to you. And over the years, as the game has evolved and it's changed from, from city to city, from state to state, everywhere you go, you can find a monopoly game. The basis has changed, hasn't it? It's how many monopolies you can get, how, how much money you can accumulate, how many hotels and houses you can get. The game which started out to warn us ended up encouraging people to get greedy and build and build and build. And this happens all the time. Carnegie Hall was once the, or Carey Hall, was once the largest Baptist church in England. It was started by William Carey back in 1793. In 1792, he started the Baptist Missionary Society, which is really the father of all of our mission societies that we, we have today. And they started sending missionaries from England and now from the United States all over the world. The church that he started became very small. In fact, in 1974, that same church, with just a handful of people left, sold it to the Hindus. Now, I find that interesting because back in the 1700s, that's where William Carey went. He went to India and to Burma to minister to the Hindus. But now the Hindus bought his church, made it into a Hindu temple, and today it's the largest Hindu temple in all of England. Now what's the moral of that? Why did things change? Because in England especially, there are very few churches that preach God's word today. And that's what's happening here in the United States as well. Amen. We are chasing rabbit trails. We are seeing who can put on the best show, bring in the most people, instead of preaching and teaching the word of God. So William Carey's church, which was once one of the largest in the world, no longer exists. And that's what happened. That's what's happening primarily with the mainline churches here in the United States. <laughs> Folks, we exist as a church to equip people to follow Jesus so that they may know him personally. That's why God told us to go. Where they may grow in their relationship with him and they may serve him as you are gifted. That's one of the reasons we're doing these spiritual gift assessments. So we can find out where you can serve. Not that everybody's going to do that. Now I know there are some folks saying, well, Pastor, I really don't want to serve. I'd just rather sit here. Well, that's your prerogative. You can do that if you want. But ask yourself, is that what God wants me to do? Folks, our mission is to know grow and serve. That's what we should be all about. And that's what every one of our ministries should include. 
Otherwise, we get off track. We start doing rabbit trails. Back in 1976, I believe, I went to the very first Moody's, uh, Moody Bible Institute's pastor's conference. And I can remember hearing Dr. George Sweeting there. And he made this. He said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Think about it. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's what we should be doing, folks. In other words, don't get sidetracked by compromise. Don't make concessions to take you away from the primary task God has called you to. And then second, don't be sidetracked by slander. Don't get off on a rabbit trail of thinking that you have to answer all the criticism, the lies about you. Don't be diverted by defending yourself against the gossip or rumors when you're here to serve God. Nehemiah didn't let these false rumors deter him from what God had called him to do. Look at what he says in verse 5. In the same way, Sambalat, for the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. Now, after privately sending Nehemiah four different letters, he now sends him an open letter. That makes it public. That makes it public. Here's what Nehemiah said in verse 6. And it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Grisham also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're rebuilding the wall or building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. These are lies. They were vicious lies, but Sanballat here is trying to force Nehemiah's hand, isn't he? He thinks that by spreading these rumors, Nehemiah is going to stop work on that wall. He's going to come and meet with them. Well, what, is, what does Nehemiah do? Well, let's look at verse 8, his reply. Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say, have been done. For you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the wall, from the work. And it will not be done, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah stays at the task, doesn't he? But then what does he do? <laughs> he prays. He prays. How many times when you have had rumors against you or falsehoods against you, have you said, God, you take care of it? That's exactly what Nehemiah is doing. His character spoke for itself. And he knew no one would believe all this negative press against him. And the fact is, folks, if you take care of your character, God's going to take care of you. That's a fact. So in pursuit of God and his will for your life, first, don't be sidetracked by compromise. Second, don't be sidetracked by slander. And third, don't be sidetracked by sin. Don't get off on a rabbit trail of disobedience to God's word. So often we do that. Nehemiah here refused to disobey God, even to save his own life. Verses 10 and 11 tells us this. Now when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mahalabel, forgive me for pronunciations, 
who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you at night. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. You see, Nehemiah refused to go into the temple because it was contrary to God's law. In Numbers chapter 3 and verse 10, only priests were allowed to go into the temple. And you see, Nehemiah feared disobeying God. Let me ask you this morning, do you? Do you fear disobeying God? Well, if you don't, you should. You should. John Wesley once said, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. You see, Nehemiah was such a man. He feared nothing but sin and desired nothing but God. No one was going to force him to disobey God. In fact, Nehemiah smelled a rabbit. I mean, I mean a rat. He smelled a rat as soon as someone suggested it. Look at what verse 12 says. And I understood in Saul that God had not sent him. And he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin. And so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. Remember Tobiah and Sanballat, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophecies, Naudia, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. Fear often leads people to sin. They're afraid of losing their popularity. They're afraid of, of losing their power. They're afraid that they're going to lose out on some sort of pleasure. So they know they're doing wrong, but their friends kind of coerce them into doing the wrong thing. And I'm sure that almost everyone in this room has done that at one time or another. We wanted to be popular. We wanted to, to, to have power. We wanted to do all these different things, knowing that it was wrong. But here, Nehemiah doesn't even let the fear of death turn him to sin. And folks, we need that same attitude. We need to stay on the right path. We need to, as I, as I preach one of the first times, Keep looking towards God. Don't let yourself be sidetracked by sin no matter what. Back in 2009, there was a rash of small plane accidents. I happened to have my license back then, and I did have, happen to have an accident. Well, what they found out was very interesting to me. They found out that pilots with less than 150 hours had fewer accidents than those pilots with over 400 hours. Now, why would that be? Well, the pilots with 
over $400 kind of assumed things. They didn't do as good a check on the airplane. They didn't do a, a pre-check. Checking every bolt, checking the, the, if there was water in the, in the gas. But those with under 150 hours, they were more meticulous. They were more careful. Wayne Cordial, where I got this study from, wrote a book called Jesus Pure and Simple. And he says this. He says, sometimes we as Christians are flying 400 hour, 400 flying hour disciples. Accidents take place because we stop doing it by the book. We stop studying the Word of God. We compromise on our devotions. We slump on following the standards of scriptures. And the Holy Spirit to inspect every rivet in our hearts and lives. We go on day after day cutting corners, wondering why we lose power on the climbs. And we stall. And do you know what happens when you stall in an aircraft? You normally crash. Don't do that. In your pursuit of God and His plan for your life, and believe me, folks, He's got a plan for every one of you. Don't cut corners. Don't slump on following the standards of Scripture. Don't be sidetracked by sin that looks so good that you want to leave God's word and follow it. And even if sin seems logical at the time, folks, it's lethal to your walk with God and the work that he's called you to do. So first, don't be sidetracked by compromise. Secondly, don't be sidetracked by slander. And third, don't be sidetracked by sin. And finally, don't be sidetracked by wrong company. Don't let your friends lead you off on those rabbit trails. Don't let wrong associations divert you from what God has called you to do. That was the problem in Nehemiah's day. Look at verse 15. So the wall is finished on the 25th day of the month of Elo. That's August, September, according to our calendar today, in 52 days. And when our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their esteem. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of God. What a great thing God did. That wall was rebuilt in 52 days. Can you imagine that? But it didn't have, didn't go without having problems, did it? In verse 17 it says, Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because he was the son-in-law of of Shechananiah, and the son of Ara, and the son of Johin, Jehohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshalam and the son of Berechiah as his wife. Also they spoke of his good deeds in the presence and recorded my, my words to him. And Tobias sent letters to make me afraid. Now, these were some unholy alliances, guys. The leaders of Judah were in partnership with the enemy. They were trying to gang up on Nehemiah. They had sided with Tobiah against Nehemiah, and it was undermining the safety of the city. We need to be careful about the partnerships we form, folks. God's word tells us in 2 Corinthians 6.14, do not be unyoked, unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Behel? And what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Now this doesn't mean that we can't spend time with unbelievers. How are we going to share the Lord if we don't do that? We need to encourage them to follow Jesus. But the Bible says don't form partnerships with an unbeliever. That's very important. Don't form a business partnership. Don't form a marriage partnership. Don't form any other kind of partnership with unbelievers. Because these, these partnerships, they'll get you sidetracked. That's because the unbelieving partner is going to try to pull you away from the Lord. Have you ever heard of the home field advantage? Got to hike my bridges. Home field advantage is not a myth. We, uh, We were in South Bend for many years, home of Notre Dame. Notre Dame is probably some of the most ruthless football fans I've ever met in my life. You go all over the world and you'll find a Notre Dame fan. They just love Notre Dame. You realize there are more wins at home with a team whether it's baseball, football, soccer, you name it. There is a hometown advantage. Now, why is that? Well, they did a study years ago, and they found that basically it wasn't the fans, although they have a lot to do with it, because the fans get kind of rowdy, don't they? I know when Ruth was in high school or in college, and uh, Michigan State was playing Notre Dame, the fans actually tipped over the fan bus, knocked it right over on its side. They get a little rough. But you know why the home team advantage is? It's the referees, the umpires. They don't like the booze. Can you believe that? So they're more likely, if there's a questionable foul, to call it on the opposing team. Home team advantage. The crowd is a big influence by all the noise coming from them. I say that to say this, those around you have a big influence on your life. Don't let them influence you in the wrong way. Be careful about the partnerships you form with individuals. So in your pursuit of God and his plan for your life, please don't get sidetracked by, by compromise. Don't be sidetracked by slander. Let God handle that. Don't be sidetracked by sin. And lastly, don't be sidetracked by keeping the wrong company. It's like the old hymn says, Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Would you pray with me? Father, I look back on my life as a Christian. And I see there were times when I've gotten sidetracked. I've allowed compromise, I've allowed slander, I've allowed sin. And I've allowed people especially to take me off track from where you have wanted me to go. And God, I'm sure I'm not alone. And I pray that as we move forward,
forward as a church, that as we move forward together <laughs> trying to build a ministry here to, to serve you, that we'll just give these things to you, allowing you to handle them. For Father, we love you and praise you, and we thank you in the name of Jesus.